Uh, I think we need to start soon in order to be in time, so I think I will start. Welcome everybody, my name is Akko Shorvat. I'm from a company called Inquiry Labs. You might have heard about us. Uh, we are the company behind or one of the main developers for Viatra. And this work was done in cooperation with CEA, especially Sebastian Revol. He was not able to attend, sadly. So I will be the one presenting uh, today's talk. As you can see, there are quite a lot of logos on this, uh, on this slide. So most of these companies or uh, European organizations has, uh, have submitted something into this presentation. Okay, so let's get started. The best of bo both words, hybrid simulation arrived to Eclipse. First and foremost, how many of you are familiar with uh, continuous time simulation? Oh, wow. And uh, have you ever heard about a uh, standard called FMI and FMUs and things like that? Wow, cool. To be honest, maybe for you guys, some part of the presentation might not be the most interesting because I try to provide a kind of broader view on this particular issue problem or simulation-based development. So if you have some questions, please come to me after the talk and then we can go into details, okay? I think one of the most important thing to start with is that within IoT, I'm usually saying that everybody's talking about on one side the user uh, perspectives, what kind of application domains are you using it? I'm using it for smart cities, I'm using it for healthcare, I'm using it to track sport. Thank God here on EclipseCon we are mainly talking about the engineering aspects, how to de define these systems, how to develop these systems, what kind of platforms, tools, libraries are available currently. But there is one particular, let's say, segment in which usually the audience of, uh, of, uh, of EclipseCon are not really familiar with. These are, let's call cyber-physical systems, which are built in many cases following ideas or tools or libraries that are already available or used on the well-known IoT aspects, but they are a little bit special because they have some additional constraints or requirements that are needed to be uh, fulfilled. You know, in transportation, like uh, automotive, for example, in certain parts, aviation, defense, safety, tunnel safety, energy grid, and things like that. And this talk and the simulation part will be mainly about simulation of these kind of systems, okay? So it's really important to put into context the why we were doing this kind of add-on or tooling. This is coming from a project called OpenCPS, which stands for Open Cyber Physical System Model Driven Certified Development. Uh, a lot of companies uh, work together. It's an EU, it's an EU Eureka project. A lot of different companies uh, work together. And the main idea was to provide a front-loading capability in development to be able to, to execute large-scale simulation early uh, from the early design models in order to be able to fix, let's say, the architecture or the requirements, what kind of system, what kind of subsystems, and what kind of sub subsystems let's say or components I would like to use which provi uh, which uh, function provider or tier one or two tier two function provider uh, is out there who is able to provide me that okay and for that there are quite a lot of commonalities within these different domains as you can see just to zoom in a little bit uh, building a a aeronautics mechanics naval automotive gas turbines and power plants all of those are heavily relying on physical simulation, simulation of the environment, ha and how our system is behaving within a uh, context, within an actual environment. Just to give you some understanding, what am I talking about? I will give you just a brief overview on the Sherpa demonstrator, which is about an automotive simulation scenario, which includes multiple domains. So in this sense, it's a hybrid simulation because multi-domains are simulated uh, in parallel. It's not the actual uh, equipment that uh, they are currently designing, but something similar, okay? So what is the context in which these kind of hybrid simulations that I'm talking about are really important? We are early in the design phase, and we would like to see what kind of characteristics our final system would look like. I don't exactly have the final uh, 
I don't exactly have the final uh, architecture of my system. I don't have the final components I would like to use. I have really high level requirements coming from the OEM or the end user. And I like to play, optimize to see within the boundaries what kind of different solutions am I able to provide. For that reason, let's say within this small demonstrator, let's consider a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And we would like to simulate together these concepts which are related to energy management. Plug-in hybrid, it means it has a fuel uh, engine and also an electric engine. It also has some impact on the thermal management, which is quite important for us. And due to the fact that our car is, uh, let's say, running on Earth, ambient environment is important. Is it cold outside? Is it warm outside? What does it mean if the hu humidity is high and the temperature is high and the sun is shining? Will it have some effect on my thermal management, which would require for me to, let's say, activate the air conditioning, which would have a significant effect on the consumptions? And also there are some end user and missions, end user facing features I would like to simulate in a certain sense. Typical uh, in the automotive domain in these early scenarios are the passenger comfort. It's relatively hard to, to formalize, but believe me, there are really sophisticated uh, models of the human body itself, which means that there is the skin layer, the fat layer, the muscle layer, and the bone, bones inside uh, a human body. And they would like to see what kind of uh, what kind of effect, let's say, the overall temperature, pressure, and so on has on the on the user. In normal situation, these are don't really uh, it's not uh, moving too fast or anything like that. But let's say if the air conditioning is not working well and we are sitting uh, in the back row, and for example, the flow is not coming to us, it might mean that you know it goes up. So a lot of additional information, physical information, needs to be included in these simulations. And next to passenger comfort, it's also important to see that what can our car do? Is it able to accelerate to 0 to 100 km per hour in 6 seconds or only in 12 seconds? So these are parameters that are important, and we would like to check them. What kind of effect do I have if I would like to have a fast car, which has a superb uh, passenger comf com, uh, comfort? Then most probably I will need a really strong engine. S sounds simple. But if, if I take everything really carefully into the equ equations, mm -hmm. like the shape of the car, the internal, the exterior, the interior, the materials I've used, the flows that are coming through the uh, ventilation systems and so on and so forth, then these simulations can get really complicated, but at, at least they will be close to the real, uh, the real uh, environment, the real, sorry, the real solution. And the, final and the final goal is to be as close as possible so I can use simulation to try out the different ideas, the different architecture candidates, let's say, or different uh, components that I would like to use. Again, how do they work? And I think when we are talking about tool development or providing tooling for such environments, it's really important to understand what the actual tool development, uh, uh, the actual development process looks like. Within this actual uh, uh, Sherpa engineering, how it works. They are using SysML as the system design, uh, system design uh, language. How many of you are familiar with SysML? Okay, it's a standard for OMG and it is used for system design. Usually from this system architecture design, they are defining some scenarios. What are we looking for? What kind of information we would like to get from the simulations? design the simulation itself, what kind of uh, domains, what kind of uh, elements, physical, physical aspects is, are important, thermodynamics, electrics, uh, mechanical, software related, anything like that. Separate guys are creating the actual simulations, simulation models, and maybe in certain cases the algorithms themselves for the one and uh, for the different domains, because one guy is good in thermodynamics, the other guy is good in mechanics, the third guy is good in software modeling, so you can imagine. We need to integrate the simulation together if there are some standards that, that, uh, that are capable of helping us out in, in situations like that, that's good. Execute the simulation, play a little bit with the input parameters, and see if the 
if the final result is good or not, and re-execute the process as, as much or as, uh, uh, as many times as necessary to, to have the final result like that, okay? I think it's not very complicated. I've, you have seen quite a lot of iterative development process. What can be interesting that this is something that needs to be developed, the separate simulation domains. Highly skilled engineers in these domains are working uh, quite hard to get these models, or you can buy it from typical third-party companies like this, as I mentioned, this human body model and things like that, okay? It's not magic. You have a SysML model which represents the components and the ports in your system, and for certain part, you need to develop, let's say, an equivalent thermal related model, for example, okay? So it's not some there's boxes and edges or something like that. You use SysML, and usually today people are using either MATLAB Simulink or Modelica to define these kind of uh, physical or continuous time uh, simulation models. How many of you are familiar with Modelica? MATLAB Simulink? I, I, I hope everybody heard about it at least. <laughs> So, what, what is the problem? System engineering guys are pushing the, uh, the system architecture model. They are modifying it, they are adding new elements and changing it. The simulation guys, the complex simulation guys, needs to follow that, and I have to put those different aspects, as you can think about as layers. This is, let's say, the thermal layer. There might be an electric layer on that, there might be a mechanic layer on that. And we need to keep those in, uh, in a kind of synchronized way. So this is something that is important. And just to show you something at the end, usually these guys are looking at the figures like this. So the final output of these simulations are usually continuous time uh, figures that are saying that, OK, we have a scenario from 0 up to 300 seconds. And this was the cabin circuit temperature and this was the demand and this was what really happened. As you can see, in the beginning it was not so good, we were doing well, it was a little bit low here, a little bit high, so yeah, it, the system tried to keep it, keep it on, the, on the actual level that was required. And based on a lot of different simulations, when you play with the input parameters, let's say tempera outside temperature, humidity, is the sun shining or not, and so on and so forth, you create enormous amount of simulations. So it's a kind of, on one way, creating the simulation models are complicated, and also then executing them on quite a lot of with parameter sweeps and whatsoever takes a lot of time. And also some tooling is required there. This is something that in order to be able to have compatibility between these kind of simulation environments, there is a standard called FMI, Functional Mockup Interface, okay? Maybe an uh, important information or a good takeaway, which tries to create black boxes, simulation black boxes. I have input values I need to set. I will receive output values, and I can say to this black box that, okay, I'm simulating you, please step 10 milliseconds, please step plus 30 milliseconds, and so on and so forth, okay? And why they have created this black box solution is that the tool provider from which you are generating these FMIs, you don't have to fear that the I your IP, your, your way of doing this simulation will, uh, will be available to anybody, so they can read it. Usually they confuse, uh, so they make some changes in the code or use some obfuscations so you don't understand what is really there. But they can give you, you can put it into your complex simulation scenario and you can work with it. There are different kinds, co-simulation and model exchange, which means that the simulation engine itself is also packed into this component, this black box or not. And a lot of tools are already supporting that, so this standard is quite uh, well known and heavily used uh, for the, for within the cyber physical system domain. But these are only good for one, let's say, domain, okay? So the thermal dynamics, one FMU, functional mock-up unit. Mechanics, another. I don't know, software uh, simulation, yet another. If we would like to go forward, we would like to see something that if I have components that describe certain parts of the system and require some input, 
Well, we well, well know we need to connect those together because some parameter information, let's say from the thermo thermodynamics, might go into the, the, the mechanical simulation. Maybe some information from the software model uh, will have some effect on the mechanical part because you know it activates an actuator and it is doing something. You know, I might uh, I might activate the power win uh, yeah, the power window so it goes down so some air will come in come inside which will have an effect on the flows that are happening which will have an effect in the overall temperature in the cabin which uh, is also calculated or simulated within the actual uh, thermodynamic simulation. And as an add-on or, or, or on top of this FM, FMI uh, standard, there is this something called SSP that might be interesting for some of you, which is a, a draft standard coming from the same organization that would like to describe using some XML descriptor, so it's not any magic in any sense, how these different components, FMUs, can be connected together and what kind of input parameters, parameter values are there, so I can provide complex simulation scenarios in a standardized way. Okay, so this is the, this is the idea. So what we have created uh, in order to support that is a kind of integrated synergy between three different tools. One is Papyrus for SysML modeling, okay? I suppose you have heard about that. It's an open source uh, uh, UML and SysML modeling environment, which can be used to define these kind of uh, FMUs, the ports. You can also use it to create the uh, connections between the inputs and output ports of these uh, different FMUs, okay? Also, as, uh, as it supports SysML, you can use this in, uh, to generate the simulation models, or at least the skeleton of it. And it can also be used to, to define these SSP configurations directly using some profiles on the actual uh, SysML models. We have a simulator called Open Modelica FMI Simulator, okay, which supports all different kind of simulation algorithms. And it uh, also, also supports uh, a new line. Uh, I wouldn't say new, but a really effective uh, uh, simulation uh, technique called transmission line modeling, which is able, which inherently uh, is, uh, it can be executed distributed in a distributed way, which is also important. And in order to be away, a little bit away from the really heavyweight uh, Papyrus tool and also to the really low level uh, FMI simulator, we have a uh, a browser-based front-end uh, based on Jupyter. Have you ever heard about Jupyter? It's, really, uh, it's a really nice piece of technology, to be honest. And within Jupyter, you are able to, to execute scripts, which are able to modify your models directly in the Papyrus environment, execute your simulations uh, within the Open Modelica FMI simulator, and also using uh, different uh, Python libraries, you are able to visualize your results. So in a certain sense, at the end, the SysML guy, the system engineer can work in his or her tool, Papyrus. The, the simulation execution expert, let's say, can have a specific notebook, can script uh, the 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 configure 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 the complex simulation scenarios using uh, scripts, and we can use any kind of tool that uh, provides a relatively simple API for executing the simulation. Okay, let's see it in action. I really hope I still have some time. Yes, full screen mode. So, I will start the stuff in order to be able to to have the web browser. So, if you are familiar, this is Papyrus. This is a, a internal bulk diagram. All the control system one, supervisor one, and operating system ones are FMUs that are represented by BDDs, so block diagrams. Okay, they have their ports and everything like that. We have imported them from, from an FMU description, okay? You can see it right here uh, in the left corner. These are, uh, oh, it starts quite fast. 
these are the FMUs that we have. They have all different kind of parameters, ports, and whatsoever that are required. And we have the simulation. This is the simulation itself, a complex simulation, in which we need to connect them together. We would be able to do that by uh, creating links between the different ports. The green is the input and the red is the output, just to make you clear. Okay, but as you can see, currently it's not connected. Well, this is a demo, so you can imagine why. Here, here we have the specific, we have the specific uh, Jupyter notebook in which we have created scripts that are directly communicating with the Papyrus uh, uh, system model. So I'm able to to execute scripts in order to be able to create those edges, those connections between the ports. Okay. So this way, if I would like to create a scenario in which certain ports are connected to different, uh, to different ports of other FMUs, I would be able to do that using Python scripts in this sense. Okay? So configuring, configuration management is far easier using this tool. Let's see it in action. Yeah, I'm executing this one. Okay, I'm executing this one. Okay, executing this one. Yes, it jumped back to the environment. It was not me. What happened is that, as you can see, a lot of elements appeared here. I just drag and drop it here. So I used the script to create all these edges here. Okay, why I did this? to demonstrate that it is possible that from the Jupyter notebook I can use scripts to modify my uh, system of description which has the FMU profile and behind those there are normal simulation models for the control system coming from MATLAB simulating from the supervisor I think that is also from uh, MATLAB simulating and also the operating system which I don't know from what kind of tool is it coming from that th there are FMUs behind them a lot of C code and things like that okay so it allowed me to change, let's say, the actual simulation uh, scenario directly from the Jupyter, from the from the Jupyter uh, notebooks. Okay, here I can set some parameters. I would like to see, let's say, the simulation until 50 seconds, and I would like to use, I don't know, this this uh, step size. Okay, it looks really nice. I'm running the simulation and as you can see I'm just executing uh, pl a plotlib which is a Python library to demonstrate that okay I would like to see what happened uh, during my simulation and I'm able to have all the different kinds using Python libraries all the different kinds of simulation results or visualizations that are needed currently I can see that it worked well at the beginning because the red one is the one I, I want to uh, have let's say that's the required and for some reason it went really bad so most probably there is some issue with the step size so I can go back here and, and let's say okay let's go smaller than that let's say let's have this it might take some time I'm waiting under the hood what is happening I, ex uh, I say run the, exec uh, run the simulation the Jupyter notebook sends some commands to the papyrus. It receives the simulation configuration. Then it uh, then it provides this information, the input parameters and the and the yeah the input parameters and the configuration to the simulation environment, and then it executes it. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's it's finished. Yes. As you can see, there aren't too many <laughs> feedback. And voila, we were able to go for, 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 forward. So the simulation went quite well up to that point. And as we can see, something really strange happened. So we can go forward and check this on different kind of, uh, on different kind of, uh, 
figures or, or yeah, figures you can say, which means that that was the required, that was the actual value that we have, and the diff is calculated based on that. And usually simulation engineers are looking for these diffs. Where, where did I fail? What is the point in which uh, I was not able to, to follow what happened? And then usually they try to debug this. As you can imagine, it's not that easy that, okay, there's something bad happened. What, what, what does it mean? Should, should it mean that the simulation is not precise enough? Does it mean that some of my models are not good enough? Does it mean that some input parameters are bad? So it's a, it's a tedious work. And you can execute other kind of scripts really simple scripts to calculate uh, certain values, where are, uh, what are the time points in which the, uh, the actual value between the required, the required uh, uh, let's say, value and the actual value is higher than 0 0.6. So as you can see, really simple scripts. So the idea here is, is that SysML guys are working in Papyrus, Use the, use the profile there to define the actual uh, FMU ports and stuff like that. There is also support to import them, though, import those, so you don't have to define. If there is already an FMU, you can import it, and then you will have this uh, actual SysML, corresponding SysML uh, block diagram. And then use the, the Jupyter uh, notebook for executing configuring, executing your simulations, and also visualize the result in a way you would like to do that, okay? So this is the main idea behind this uh, tool. And I will just, uh, yes. Oh my God, no. I will get back here. Yeah, sorry, I didn't make <laughs> the l this jump. So the demo was about the model itself, a little bit about the FMU SSV. We haven't touched it too much. And also uh, demonstrating the dashboard, the parameter setting, and the visualization through the Jupyter uh, notebooks. How does it look like under the hood? How many of you are familiar with the EASE plugin, which is a, a, scripting, a scripting plugin within Eclipse? Okay. We have heavily used that, to be honest. That was the main driving factor for us. So we have, uh, we have extended Papyrus to support FMI and SSP. That was relatively easy with these profiles and some code generators and importers and exporters. Then in Jupyter, we created a kernel uh, based on the IPython kernel. So it was just some small modifications that were required. Uh, using the ESZ, um, uh, plugin with, within uh, Eclipse. We have extended the P, P4J engine a little bit in order to support what uh, some specialties are required on, on our side. Created the integration between Papyrus and the scripting engine. Voila, the two upper bo uh, boxes are solved. And thank God, why we use this, that for the Open Modelica FMA, FMI simulator, they already support a kind of uh, Python API, which we were able to use, provide the required information. And this is how the actual tool looks like. And we were pushing mainly the buttons in the, in the Jupyter notebook, okay? So that was the idea to have a kind of integrated uh, environment for creating this iterative workplace uh, on different, uh, different uh, system architectures scripting, so providing complicated uh, scenarios, setting the values, executing the, executing the simulations, and then uh, visualizing the results. And based on that, either make some changes in the simulation scenario or make some changes in the simulation models, okay? Well, <laughs> usually it's nice to say a few words about the, uh, the the advantages of this, uh, this system? Well, we call this at this point Papyrus for, for FMI. What is interesting is that, uh, that uh, through this uh, ESA, 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 ESA uh, plugin, you are able to script uh, Papyrus and you are able to modify the model. And this is just a, this is just a solution that helps you to, 
to get rid of a lot of repetitive uh, work, usually structure connections, because it happens that at the early stages you can imagine that also these FMUs are changing. So there are new ports on them, some ports uh, names are changing and things like that, and whenever you import those, then you will always have to create these connections, which is a really tedious work. And in case of real case uh, models, uh, one FMU might have a hundred ports or even more, let's say 50 output ports, 50 input ports, so a lot of ports. And if you have multiple FMUs, it can get quite complicated to do it by hand. So in these cases, scripting is really useful. Also, uh, visualizing the results, I think it's something uh, really important. Eclipse also supports some tooling for that. There are some uh, uh, plugins for this or features, but usually on the, what you have on the web and especially around Python, which is now really strong also in the, in the uh, big data community and also different data communities. They are already have enormous amount of different uh, and really powerful visualization libraries, so you are able to use that within a browser, which helps you to uh, separate, let's say, quite easily the, also the, the, actual, the actual simulation execution from the visualization. So it might be distributed, as I mentioned, if OM simulator, uh, if you would like to execute uh, the, or run the simulation distributed, OM simulator will provide a distributed execution mode quite soon, the next version as far as I know. So it gives you this ability and you will not be bound directly to, to use Eclipse. You can use any browser-based environment to, to do that. And also it's quite uh, straightforward to to modify the Jupyter Notebook to give buttons, uh, different uh, sliders, and so on and so forth, which for us doesn't seem very complicated, but for a simulation guy who is working on looking on these figures and trying to figure out, this, this is something really useful. So they really enjoy it that, okay, can we, can we have a slider for this parameter? Yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. And it's quite easy to add them. So they really enjoy. And sooner or later, they also start using the scripting uh, part. So they are creating their own scripts in order to, to have these complex scenarios. So what is the takeaway from today's talk? Uh, Papyrus for FMI is, let's say, version 0 0.1, so a proof of concept is, uh, is, is, is ready. We have some, we have some uh, uh, licensing issues right now. So for that reason, we really want to have it open source under e uh, EPL uh, v2. But uh, there are some libraries and, uh, and other components that we use that are BSD and uh, some of them may be GPL and some of them are boost. So we need to, to see where we need to cut it. So what is that we can give without issues under EPL uh, version 2 and what are the parts which you might need to download from other sources or other places, okay? Uh, scripting seems to be really important in these scenarios, in these uh, simulation scenarios. Uh, don't forget, usually the simulation experts or simulation guys are mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, so they are not really software guys. So for some of them, even uh, scripting is something like a high-tech way of, 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 of doing certain jobs, okay? So it's not, it's not uh, normal for them to code, to directly write scripts or code. And it seems that round-tripping is, is uh, getting more important. What is missing, and uh, during this development, we have faced it many times, that debugging is completely uh, non-available non or not available in these domains. So it's really hard if, if the simulation is, is providing some strange results. It's really hard to see what is really happening, and you are not really able to do this step by step. What is happening inside an FMU, I don't know, because it's a black box. But still, if, if would, it would be, let's say, white box in a certain sense or gray, or I would receive some information coming out of the, the FMU, or the standard might be extended to support some kind of debugging features, that would be really cool. Distribution ex distributed execution is the future. There are two ways of distributed execution, don't forget. One, when the same simulation is executed, but with different uh, input parameters, usually this is the easier way, or 
This one simulation scenario is so complex that for certain parts I need completely different nodes in order to be able to execute it in a performant way, okay? And the OM simulator is looking for both. And the second one is the more, let's say, more, I wouldn't say interesting, but uh, a harder problem. And finally, I think what is the most important part is that the standards are evolving and the community around it is quite uh, uh, open. So the, the idea is to move forward, both the FMI and the SSP standards, so they would be able to support uh, the needs and especially what I haven't touched, the software related simulations, which are currently are quite complicated to get it into the uh, these FMU blight boxes. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, either send an email to me, Sebastian, check the web page of the project, or just come by me and we can talk about the details. Thank you very much.